Hey friend, I'm Mike McCurry. You are listening to the Bible Tract Echoes radio broadcast, and I'm so very thankful that you are. Today on the broadcast, we are going to conclude a powerful message from Dr. Paul Levine, our founder, the man whose voice was first heard on Bible Tract Echoes, this very radio broadcast, well over many decades ago, back in 1958. Today on the broadcast, we conclude a message entitled this, Peter in the Sifter. Peter in the Sifter. We've talked about the fact that we can't be too careful. We've talked about the fact that there is an evil one that wants to destroy us, destroy our testimony, and make us unusable for the glory of God. Well, friend, that's not my prayer. My prayer is that I, that we, that this ministry would remain usable and make, a, and make an incredible impact for the glory of God. I want you to listen today with an open mind and stick around for just a few comments at the conclusion of the broadcast. Now, let's step back in time all the way back to 1979 and Dr. Paul Levine is preaching to us. I know of a man who went to a foreign mission field as a missionary but had to come home in disgrace because he got mixed up with a woman over there. You say, a missionary? Yeah. If a missionary would fall like that, no telling what you and I might do under, under certain circumstances if we're weak. See? I know of another case where a man and his wife went to a foreign mission field, and while they were over there, this was in Africa, the wife of the missionary had a lesbian affair. The lesbian affair was, they had to come home in disgrace. See? The devil couldn't keep them from going to Bible college. The, 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 the devil couldn't keep the young man from going to seminary. He couldn't even keep them off the mission field. But he could destroy their testimonies in a moment of weakness. And that's what the devil's out to do. Boy, you know, it's, it just sort of scares me when I think about it, how the devil is out to destroy lives. I held a series of meetings in a certain town. And the pastor says, now I want you and Bob to come back next year. So next year, about a month before the meetings were to start, I got a letter from one of the deacons of the church. And in this letter it says, our pastor's gone. But we want you to come and conduct the meetings anyhow. So I wrote back and I said, well, I was, wait a minute. It all depends on why your pastor's gone. I said, why is your pastor gone? And if he's gone, how many more people have gone? I said, what's happened? You have a big church spread or something? I said, tell me more. He wrote back and he said, no, the only ones who are gone are the pastor and the family of the young lady and he went down to the hotel to live with. A choir member. And here this pastor, who was uh, 45 or 50 years of age, took a young woman about 18 or 20, took her down to the hotel right in the very town where they lived and had an affair with her down there. And he said, that's why he's gone. And that family left. Everybody else is here. Will you please come? So I said, all right, I'll come. Okay. So uh, it's about 150 or miles or less from where I live. So I got on a bus, went over there, and I got there about 11 o'clock at night. One of the deacons met me. And he said, Bob, your singer and his wife are going to stay with the family out in the country. And he said, you're going to stay in the parsonage. See, the pastor was gone now. He said, you're going to stay in the parsonage. Nobody in that parsonage. I said, who else is going to stay with me in that parsonage? He said, nobody else. He said, you just can stay there and have the whole parsonage to yourself. Well, I said, I'm not going to stay there. Well, he said, you're not? I said, no, I wouldn't take a chance on staying there. Now, if I could picture this parsonage to you, it was a parsonage that had a long porch, but the porch didn't go across the front of the parsonage. The porch went along one side of it. And you go up on the, go up the front steps and you walk and you'd walk uh, uh, on the porch quite a distance to the front door. Now, if you were coming from one direction, you could see that front porch. But if you were coming from another direction, you couldn't see that front porch. So I said to this fellow, now I said, look, you just had some moral troubles with your pastor. And he's gone. And I said, now look, supposing I'm staying there by myself. And I was just a young fellow then. 
Then now it's so ugly and old, nobody make any difference. Nobody accuse me of anything anymore now. But this is when I was young and, and good looking, see? And had a lot of money, too, in those days. So uh, I said, now look, I said, um, I know this parsonage. I've, I've, uh, I stayed there during other meetings. And I said, if somebody comes from that direction, they can't see that porch. Then I said, supposing a lady comes up on the porch and she's selling magazines or she's taking a census or something, she knocks on the door. And I go to the door, and I don't let her in. So I close the door, and she walks off the porch. And just as she's walking off the porch and coming down those front steps, here comes some member of the church or somebody that hates the church, come driving along in the car, and they see a woman walk out of the... They say, oh, I saw a woman walking out of that parsonage where that preacher's staying. See? Man alive. I said, they could start all kinds of stories. And I said, no, I'm not going to stay there. I'm scared to stay there. Well, all right. I said, I'll tell you what, just take me to a hotel and I'll pay my own way in the hotel. No, I said, well, well I want you to pay your own way. He said, I'll take you home with me. And so uh, I went home with him and I could see that his wife was scurrying around like 60, uh, fixing the, their bed for me to sleep in. And I said, uh, that the only bed you have here? He said, yes. He said, we're going to let you take our bedroom. I said, where are you going to sleep? Well, he said, I don't know. We'll sleep on the floor or sleep somewhere. And there was a couch in the front room. And I said, you don't have to do that. I said, I'll be glad to sleep on this couch. I thought it was one of these couches that opened up into a bed. See? And he says, you mean that? I said, yeah, that'll be all right with me. I'll just sleep here on the couch. The thing didn't open up, and it was too short for me. And my hind legs went over this end, and my neck went over this end, and I, and I slept in this position. For two weeks, I slept on that couch. It wasn't long enough for me. Head hanging over one side. I felt, every morning when I got up, I felt like I had a broken neck. And my hind feet falling over the other side. But I'd rather, go, I'd rather do that than stay in that parsonage by myself and have somebody start a story. Boy, listen, we can't be too careful. Satan's purpose is to wreck your testimony before your wife, your kids, the people you work with, the people you know. And then, number two, the Savior's prayer. Notice that. The Lord Jesus said to Simon... The devil's going to sift you, but I have prayed for you. Boy, that, that, that would be the most wonderful thing to have somebody tell you. I, I saw Jim Stoutenborough one day. The man leads you singing here. And he said, Brother Paul, he said, this morning I had breakfast with Dr. John R. Rice in his home. They lived at that time in Wheaton, Illinois. He said, I had breakfast with Dr. John R. Rice. And he said, I was there for their family altar. And he said, he prayed for you out loud. I could hardly believe it. I said, you mean a big man like John R. Rice? Remembering to pray for a little pumpkin like me? He said, yes, he prayed for you out loud. And he says he, he does that every day. I've had several people say, I pray for you every day. I just can't hardly believe they mean it, but I guess they do. There was Jim Stoutenborough. Isn't it wonderful to know that, that Dr. John R. Rice would pray for me every day? Wouldn't it be wonderful to have some giant in prayer like praying Hyde or Charles Finney or somebody like that say, I pray for you every day? Well, I know somebody's praying for you and me every day. Our blessed Lord is praying for us every day. He's our high priest and he prays for us every day because we're weak. See? One more thing. We've had Satan's purpose in the sifting business to destroy our testimony. Satan's prayer. He says, I've already prayed for you, Peter. And then, last, the sinner's praise. Peter. Praise God when it was all over with. And when it was all over with him, Peter went through the sifter and he denied the Lord and he cussed and he swore and he lied and went through it and failed so miserably and everybody saw the chaff in Peter's life. Peter learned a lesson. Oh, he says, have I learned a lesson. He said, I've learned my lesson. I need to pray more. I need to read my Bible more. I need to have family older more regularly. And I've learned what a treacherous, wicked heart I have. And I have learned how cunning Satan is. And I've learned how powerful sin is. I've learned something else. I've learned what a wonderful Savior I have. Peter went through the sister. Later on, after the Lord's resurrection, he met him one day and he said, Peter, listen to this now. You love me. And if this would have been before Peter went through the sister and had the chaff knocked out of him, you know what Peter would have said? Oh, he just said a real out so everybody could hear it. And the Lord said, Peter, you love me? Why? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. I love you more than anybody else around here loves you. He didn't. Not now. He's not bragging now. See? He's not boastful now. The chaff's gone. Instead of that, he says, well, now, Lord, if I love you, you know it. You know whether I love you or not. And the Lord kept pressing him, do you love me? And he just kept saying, uh, Lord, you, if I love you, you know it. Now notice this. 
And this about, time's about gone. Notice this. Before the sifting, before Peter went through the sifter, and everybody saw the chaff, he said, I'll go with you into prison and into death. But he didn't. Now notice, after he has gone through the sifter and after he has failed and everybody has seen the chaff and after he's learned his valuable lesson, he didn't say, I'll go with you into prison and into death. But bless God, he did. First time he did a lot of talking and did nothing. Afterwards, he didn't talk any, but he produced the goods. And he went with the Lord Jesus into prison. He was in prison often. And he went with him into death. When they crucified him, he said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord, so just crucify me upside down. The sifter had done its work. Now look, if you and I would let the Lord winnow us, if we would just let him point out the chaff in our life, and we repent of it, and confess it, and put it aside, he would winnow us and get rid of the chaff that way. But if he won't, if we don't let the Lord winnow us and separate the wheat from the chaff the easy way, he may allow you and me to go through the devil's sifter and learn the hard way. As people see the chaff and see our failures, we may have to learn the hard way, that we've got to get rid of the chaff one way or the other through Satan's sifting or the Savior's winnowing. Is it possible that Dr. Paul went just a little too far in his desire to stay away from accusations? Is it possible that he may have gone overboard in abstaining from all appearance of evil? It's certainly possible. But I believe one of the reasons that Bible Tracks Incorporated has been so very blessed and so highly thought of for these many years is for that very reason because we had a founder that took precautions that was maybe, just maybe, too careful. I'm thankful for our legacy. I'm thankful for our history. I'm thankful for the fact that there aren't skeletons popping out of every closet around us. I'm thankful for the fact that I can look back and think of the good name of Dr. Paul Levine. But can I ask you to pray for me and pray for us here at BTI today? Pray that we continue and keep this good legacy alive for the glory of God. Let's be careful because you can't be too careful. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being a part of our partnership, a part of our ministry. Greatly appreciate your investment of time. Have a great day for His glory. God bless.